This is Anthony and Areno, and you're listening to In the Arena. Step into the arena. Oh boy. So this week, I was brave enough to invite my younger brother, Jake Anarino, into the arena to talk about his life as a professional stand-up comedian. And I particularly wanted to ask him about his work as an improv comedian and how he's incorporated some of the rules of improv into his act. And it went fine most of the way, but towards the end, you may be offended. And when we get to the song... If you listen to the song, I am not responsible for you being offended in any way. He is a professional stand-up comedian, so you have to know that. And he does work blue. So this is my younger brother, Jake, talking about comedy, talking about getting his start in the business at 17 and touring the country, the rules of improv, and trusting the process. Here we go. Hold on to your hats. Hey, Jake, what's happening? Hello. Where are you? I'm in Kansas City, Missouri, home of uh, Delicious Barbecue. It's awesome, man. I'm playing the Improv Comedy Club, and uh, it's nice, man. I'm staying at the Hilton. It's beautiful. uh, They're treating me good. Next week, I'm in Toledo at the Funny Bone Comedy Club, and then, um, oh, last week was pretty cool. I was in Nashville working with uh, Steve-O from Jackass. Yeah. Uh, Everybody knows Steve-O, man. Hilarious. Cool dude. You'd like him. And you guys were out drinking and raping and pillaging? No. He's uh, he's been sober for like five years, man. And uh, he he really got his life together. It's pretty cool to see. Uh, It was a great turnaround, you know? It's it's awesome. So, So you know, you go to the public library and AA meetings together. Pretty much, yeah. That's more like it. No, but, but you know, we we definitely weren't partying hard. We were working, you know. He, he stays after his show's over and takes pictures and autographs with every single person in the audience. So when you go to a Steve-O show, it's not like you just get to see him and he disappears and you never get to – you actually get to talk to him, shake his hand, pose for a picture. You know, he's an awesome guy. That's super cool for him to do that. Man, he signed a book for me. I didn't even ask for it. He just signed a he, – he wrote a New York Times bestseller called Professional Idiot, and he, he gave me that. He uh, he did a lot of stuff uh, for me. He's, he's been really nice to me. I've worked with him before, and he's always, like, the nicest guy, and he's really smart. Like, he's uh, one of the smartest guys I know, um, which is weird. You think the guy's on jackass, and he staples his balls to his leg. How smart could he be? But man, he's pretty smart. He he actually, when you talk to him, you're you're like, it's it's shocking how intelligent the guy is and and how just well how well he thinks things through. And and there went my clean rating on iTunes. Thank you. Oh so no, sorry, man. Home. When your brother's a professional stand-up comedian, you're gonna lose your clean uh, rating pretty quick. So just one episode though, right? Two, two. This will make two. What happened on the other one? Howard, you must have had somebody awesome. Yeah, Howard Bloom dropped the f bomb a couple times, but whoa, Howard Bloom did? I couldn't stop him. He was on a roll. So I know you, but a lot of people listening to this um, won't know you. So let me, I guess, set up who you are, and I want you to. What are you trying to say? You're unknown to people that care about the content Anything. that I normally produce. Mm-hmm. So in and for third good reason. grade. You drew a picture, a stick figure of yourself, and you said when you grew up you were going to be a comedy man. And uh, that's crazy to me that you you would be able to project something like that in third grade. But then they gave us – here's what happened. They gave us an assignment in school, and it said, tell us what you want to be when you grow up. To, uh, try to vision yourself as an adult. And I had – and I didn't know I did this, actually. Mom – 
said, hey, i got to show you something. And she pulled out this box full of old papers and stuff from school. There weren't a lot of A-plus papers for me in there. But there was one of a, a manila piece of paper, and it said, what do you want to do to be when you grow up? And, yeah, I, I put comedy man and drew a stick figure of myself. So when it's, they said, what do you want to be when you grow up, you the first thing that came to your mind was not growing up. Yeah, well, I'm, st- I'm still doing a good job at that. <laughs> so 17, but, uh, you are in your senior year of high school, and that's when you really start doing comedy professionally. Tell that story. M- Mom and Dad said, uh, you have to go to college. I said, I don't want to go to college. They said, you have to. I said, what if I have a job? They said, if you have a job, you don't have to go to college. There just happened to be an audition at the time for a improv group. And the guy who ran the improv group was named Michael Loftus. He's uh, the head, one of the head writers for Anger Management on FX. It's Charlie Sheen's show. And uh, he had this group that was just, they'd worked together for years. And they had, they were like the hottest improv group in the, in the country. One of them, anyways, maybe Second City beat them, but that's about it. But they studied with Second City. Um, I auditioned for this group and I got in and I didn't have to go to college because I had already booked a, like a 30 city tour with these guys and they were a great improv group, man. <clears throat> so I got a great comedy education instead of a, some sort of college education and I learned improv comedy and that helped me develop my stand up act, the skills I learned uh, with these guys. These guys would workshop. A lot, several times a week. They weren't good because they didn't practice. They practiced and practiced uh, so much it was unbelievable. And uh, that, that it paid off on stage. I want to get to that improv bit, but I remember you were 17 and you were playing in bars. And I right. played in bars when I was that age, too, and, and it was before I was legal. But you were touring the country um, from bar to bar. What was that like? Crazy. There was nights I couldn't even get in the bar unless I until I told them you have to. I'm the comic. They, the, I remember one club. They said, uh, "I need to see your ID." I said, "Well, I'm I'm 17." They said, "We can't let you in." I said, "Well, I'm the feature act." And the guy said, "Oh, okay. Well, then come on in. You want a beer?" <laughs> That's the road. Yeah, it was crazy. That's funny. So let's talk about improv because I think this part is interesting to business people and salespeople. And there's some rules to improv. And I think when you watch, you know, whose line is it or, or something like that, or you go to your comedy club and you see improv, you don't recognize that there are some well-established rules that make improv work and that violating those rules just immediately makes improv fail. So can you, can you list out three or four of those rules and talk about them? What's the first rule that comes to mind when, when you think about improv? For me, and I don't know what the books say, I can't remember exactly, but for me, the number one rule is don't negate. If I come on to the, if, if, if I'm developing a scene with you <clears throat> and I try to set up some sort of reality, don't negate it. I, there was a guy in, in uh, the Groundlings, I studied with the Groundlings in Los Angeles for a while, and there was a guy who would always screw me like that. I would say, um, for example, such a hot day. I think I'll pour a nice glass of lemonade for us. And he would say, that's not lemonade, that's milk. Well, okay, the crowd gets a cheap laugh out of it, but then you destroyed the reality I created. It confuses them. It makes one of us look crazy, and it it slows the scene down. It's better if you, instead of saying no, always say yes. I think that's uh, a great rule. Uh, Yes and, you know. Right. Uh, Right. this is my new car. Yes, it is your new car, and it's red. Uh, that that pushes the scene forward rather than tripping it up with no, it's not. That's not your car. That's my car, or whatever. Um, don't go for the people go for cheap laughs by by breaking that rule, but it's really a terrible rule to break. I've been in sales meetings where I've seen salespeople negate other salespeople, where in a team call, somebody will say something, and then the next person says something to the effect of, well, it's not exactly like that. And then you just create so much doubt and and mistrust in the other person's mind because, again, somebody sets something up and then you stomped on it. And now they're not sure what to think or believe. What are some Mm -hmm. other rules? Don't ask questions. When you keep asking questions, that slows the scene down too. Um, 
for example, like uh, if I'm developing a reality or if I'm creating a reality and say I'm, I'm Abe Lincoln building a log cabin or something, um, don't come into the scene and say, what are you doing? Who are you? What, where are you? know, the, sh You're supposed to show and don't tell. Come in and say, Abe Lincoln, good to see you. Nice log cabin you're building. Uh, rather than, is, you know, what are you doing? Uh, is that a cabin you're building? Stuff like that. Don't make the other actor answer questions. Help them paint the picture. Yeah, I could see how that would stop it. So you ask a question and then there has to be an answer instead of the next line. Yeah. Yeah, then, it happens a lot. Give me another one. Don't try to be funny. Just let it come. That's a really counterintuitive one with yeah, most how does, people. It's, how does that work? It's comedy. It's improv. <clears throat> well, the, the greatest improv actors that I've seen, and I've seen a lot, it's they're not trying too hard. It just sort of comes for them. And, and the, the thing with improv is it's a team game. It really is. You have to be a team or it fails. When you have three guys in a scene all trying to outwit each other and be the funniest clown, then they cancel each other out, and the scene's usually just horrible or awkward. It doesn't work. But when you have three guys who become a character, commit to that character, and go for it, and instead of trying to be funny, pass the ball to each other, set each other up, make each other look good, uh, throw an underhanded pitch to a guy to let him knock it out of the park. When you work as a team, <clears throat> the, the, it's brilliant when, when, it, when you're all on the same page like that, and you're not... Uh, the funny will come, you know. If you're if you have three actors with comedic tendencies up there, even if they try to play it straight, nine out of ten times something funny's going to happen. You know it, and yeah. uh, you just have to trust that. And a lot of people panic if it's not coming, well, so, so they try to force it. So it's trust in the process. It is. It absolutely is. How long did it take you to be able to develop that skill set? I mean, it's because it's so counterintuitive and you, you want to uh, draw attention to yourself and you want to be funny. How long does it take before you can set that, that to the side? Or did they just it, eat it out of you right out of the gate? No, it took a long time. I annoyed my uh, other actors for years. A lot of us did, you know, um, for a while until we got it together. See, MCTD, Midwest Comedy Tool and Die, when they had those auditions, they took a bunch of new actors in. Well, I think every one of us was trying to prove how funny we were and that we belonged, and our improv was very poor at first, but then after workshopping with these guys and, and seeing the way they did it and working as a team and, and observing all that, it, it finally sunk in, but it took years for me to get that, which is I was a kid. I probably wasn't too too sharp, but uh, yeah, it's that's it's uh, it's not easy to learn. Even when somebody tells you, it doesn't register because what? you just your your gut says be funny. There's an audience. Say something funny. What do you do when you don't have something funny to say? I mean, what do you do when it, it comes around? Sam, I turn? always have something funny to say. Okay. I'm hilarious. <laughs> what if you don't though? You're on the spot. You're in the middle of a scene and something gets thrown your way and it, you just don't have anything. I just commit to the character. Uh, well, I was lucky. I was in a group with Michael Loftus. I could pass the ball to him and funny's on the way. <laughs> when you have a teammate like that, it's great. You can kind of sit back and let them do their thing and throw them an assist when you need to. And it makes you both look great. And it, and it makes the scene look great. But uh, uh, when, the, when we, we definitely had scenes that bombed, we would try to just commit to the character and get to the end and get to the next thing. So give me an example of committing to the character. Uh, well, say I'm uh, waking up with a hangover in the scene, and I'm in, I'm in my apartment. I try to uh, commit to that. I try to really do the things that I would do in that situation. Um, you know, make the coffee, maybe take an aspirin, uh, stretch, um, act like the phone's ringing and it hurts my ears real bad. Really try to paint the picture uh, and not try to kind of see if I, if I was trying to just be funny, um, it, it wouldn't it wouldn't quite work. But if I act, if I commit to the character and just do what they do, 
um, somehow it, it, it works. Like if you're George Washington, be George Washington. Go all the way with it. Don't be um, some guy acting like George Washington with a couple of vague references. Um, really be the character. Stand like they stand. Talk like they talk. Act like they would act. Um, react to situations the way you think they would react. And really do it. Commit to it 100%. These improv skills have become part of your your stand up act, and in each act you do a lot of riffing with the audience. And uh, God have mercy on their souls for showing up and sitting anywhere near the front of any one of your shows, especially yeah, if right. they have anything that's going to draw attention to themselves. So, a, like a a hot wife or girlfriend or something of that nature, they're going to get they're they're absolutely going to end up talking to you. But you're really good at that. That's your gift, I think, is, and it comes from those improv chops. But the one thing that you do that I think really sets you apart is just picking up the guitar and writing a song about all the people that you just spoke to during your act. So you're headlining and you do an hour. And some part of that, you might talk to eight or ten people, and then you weave them all together in a song. Where did that mm. come from, and how did you how did you know that you could do that? I mean, you pick up the guitar. Is it just all improv chops? How did you how did you find the courage to just accept that the next thing out of your mouth was going to work? I, you know what, man? I I'm not sure. I know, like I when I started learning to play guitar, and we were in the improv group, we would have a lot of time in hotels and stuff, and me and the guys would get the guitars out and jam and just make up songs about whatever, whoever was in the room, you. Know, no, and uh, I would learn kind of like that. I, I guess that must have been the way I learned. And, and in my drinking days, it was just kind of a, a game I would play. I'd get on stage, do a couple shots, and, and it was kind of like a game to myself to see if I could do it. And uh, I got, I don't know, after time, I just got good at it. It's, it's fun to me. It's kind of like just something I do. I would do it even if I wasn't a comedian. I would make up songs about people, making fun of them, make them laugh, whatever. It's fun for yeah. them too. They love it, even if they're the, yeah. the even if they're the butt of the joke. They still love it. Oh, I made a song burying this guy last night, and he loved it more than anybody. What what was what did you say about him? Uh oh, all kinds of stuff. Uh, making fun of um, him and talking about he had this really hot wife with him, and told I, you uh, I know kept, it. Yeah, I kept telling him. Uh, to stop cock blocking me, I was trying to get somewhere with her, and uh, so I wrote a song because he was a warehouse worker, and I and he had all these gold teeth and jewelry, and I said, "What do you store in your warehouse? Weed or blow?" Because I mean, you don't get jewels like that in a hot chick with it at a warehouse job. So I wrote a song about um, just a crooked warehouse job worker and his piece of ass wife, and how I wanted to bang her, and uh, how small his penis was, and. Uh, how ugly he is and just all just vicious to the guy and he absolutely loved it smiling ear to ear he couldn't get enough of it and then they gave me a check i got paid for it <laughs> that's funny unbelievable let this be a I, I mean how are you going to get a check for that i found a way to uh instead of going to a crazy house i found a way to get paid for it <laughs> that's funny i know you want to share a song so i'm going to just go ahead and let you share your song it could be at my expense. I have no idea what to expect here. I do have some sort of editorial uh, license here. No. Uh, but l you... let, let's go here and, and head in here a little bit of uh, what you do. All right. If you watch the show in the arena, then you'll make a lot of money and get lots of vagina. You better tell your uncle and your sister Tina to gather round for the show in the arena. It stars the man everybody knows. He goes by the name of Anarino. Better listen to every word that he said. He got a Frankenstein scar on the side of his head. So if you want to throw a big up Nina, you better watch the show called in the arena. Arena. Maybe you won't pay the side to pass. If that's the case, kiss my big black ass in the arena. In the arena. It don't start Charlie Sheen. It's in the arena. In the arena. In the arena. Take 
y'all close to the cleaner and watch in the arena. I'm mostly speech. There it is. It's beautiful. Have you ever had a guest on that said vagina and bigger pina? I, I, or any of that? I honestly, That's a first. I never have. It is an absolute first. And I'm trying to out dirty Howard Bloom. <laughs> you did it without any trouble, and I knew you would. And you said watch in the arena, and you know this is a podcast, right? Oh, I thought this was a uh, video chat deal we were doing. <laughs> No, just a just a podcast, but watch it anyway. You could sit on your computer and just watch the screen as it's playing. <laughs> that would be you would have no life whatsoever, really. Just so where where do people go to find out about you? Um, I have a podcast called the Hardcore Travel Cast. I travel from city to city at all these different comedy clubs, and I broadcast like a little radio show. Um, and actually, I, it's weird. I've been getting uh, listeners from like the Netherlands and Ireland and stuff lately. It's crazy. I don't know how they found me, but thanks, guys. And uh, you could reach me at uh, jakeanarino.com. That's Jake and uh, the spelling of your last name. They can figure right. that out. <clears throat> um, also, I'm on blueberry.com. Uh, my podcast is there. It's on iTunes. I have a new album on iTunes, CD, I should say called Nonsense and Vulgarity. It's a bunch of horrible songs that I wrote. They're all offensive. Like, I have one that's titled, You Put... Radio Edit. I know that's a first on your podcast right there. I've got to find a way to beep that. <laughs> oh, man. And yeah, you, you, can't, you can't tell me to come on your show and be clean. That's like telling me to fight a fight with one hand tied behind my back. And this is May 25th. Where are you next weekend? The Toledo Funny Bone, Toledo, Ohio. I, w I will put a link up for that. Thanks for being here, Jake. Okay, uh, thank you, man. That was my brother, Jake Anarino, and you can find him at jakeanarino.com. Go there. He's got a little newsletter link at the bottom, so you can find him and follow him. As always, you can find me at thesalesblog.com, and when you get there, do sign up for the newsletter. Every Sunday morning, you'll get my best ideas and something you can use to get your week started. Thanks for being here, and I will see you next week in the arena.